What is happening, everybody? Hope everyone is having an excellent Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day is exactly why this video is a little late, because I went out and got a little wasted last night. And while I watched this episode in a mild state of intoxication, I feel relatively prepared to offer a review and recap. If I'm a little foggy on a few of the details, I apologize in advance. I took copious notes, and uh, we'll see how reliable they are. But here we are, end of episode seven of season three of The Leftovers. This story is rapidly drawing to a close, and I guess the conversation now should shift from reviewing individual episodes to reviewing the season as a whole. Obviously, that'll be wildly unfair to offer a full review of this season until we know how things are resolved in the final episode. But this episode really was wrapping things up on a variety of fronts. In some ways that were very satisfying, some ways perhaps less so, but it really seems like what they're building to is a massive potential reconciliation or conclusion of some kind between Kevin and Nora in episode eight, because there's really nothing left to talk about in this story. I mean, obviously the big giant elephant in the room is, will we find out what happened to the 2%, where they went, and the fact that Nora's story is so intimately and so intensely tied up with the people who are claiming to have a way of visiting those people again, I have a feeling there's going to be some major revelation next episode. Or at least there better be, or there are going to be a lot of fans like myself screaming, What the fuck? At any rate, let's talk about episode 7. Title episode's a bit of a mouthful. The most powerful man in the world and his identical twin brother. It'll all make sense as we get into the recap. So the episode begins with what might be my favorite scene of the episode. It's a very tender, intimate scene between Nora and Kevin in the bathtub. They're talking about what they want to have happen to them when they shuffle off this mortal coil. And Nora's talking about how she wants to be cremated and how her brother Matt's going to try and stop her. Kevin promises to make sure that... She will get her way, and he asked if he can be stuffed, like with taxidermy. Which is a very funny kind of gallows humor moment, and it just shows just it was a little reminder of just how intense their relationship is, just how like how beautiful the relationship can be in a lot of ways. And we get this great transition where she pulls him underwater, and as she pulls him underwater, we cut to the present, where he is effectively drowning himself on that little seesaw by the pond. All of his friends they come rushing out to stop him, and you can tell that Kevin Sr. is almost kind of wounded that Kevin Jr. went ahead and decided to start the process without him while he was passed out from the, the drugs that were in his food. He's like, well, I thought, I thought we were all going to do this together. <laughs> it's, you know, in the end, there's no, uh, I guess, there are no stereo instructions for how all this stuff works. I guess Kevin was just operating under the assumption that since this was his idea, he kind of needs to be present for all this, which I can totally understand. In any case, they decide to go through with it. They lower him back down and Kevin <gasps> sucks in the water and boom, he finds himself back in this world where we saw it in the previous season where he was the international assassin. This time around, it's a lot different. It's much more of a twisted mirror image of the reality that we know from the story. And not only that, we have Kevin the assassin along with Kevin the president, who not only is president, but also a member of the Guilty Remnant. One of the major changes in season three relative to season one and two has been the absence of the Guilty Remnant. They've been such a huge part of the story to date, but obviously this season has been much more focus on our central characters and on Kevin and Nora. But in this alternate reality, not only is Kevin, a member of the Guilty Remnant, he's the President of the United States, he dresses all in white. His Secretary of Defense is Patty Levin, you know, Liv Tyler's back on the scene. I mean, a lot of these familiar faces are back. So we have an interesting scenario where Kevin, the international assassin, is his job or his mission is to assassinate himself. The flip side is that Kevin, the President and the member of the Guilty Remnant, is being pressured by his organization to blow up the world with nuclear weapons. But the only way you can do so is by getting a key that has been buried in the heart of his twin brother. So it's a really strange thing where they're trying to get to each other, but they're not quite sure what they're going to do when they finally find one another. So the whole point of this mission of our actual Kevin Jr. and the leftovers, like, normal reality is to go in there and gather information because his father Kevin Sr. is convinced that if he finds Christopher Sunday, the aborigine who died, and learns his song, that Kevin Sr. can then combine that song with all the other aboriginal songs and sing this grand theme that will prevent the end of the world and stop the flood from coming. That is basically the gist of his mission. But there's other things that he's supposed to do while he's in there. Most of the characters in Kevin's life 
have lost people who are dear to them. So they all want him to look for them on the other side and share a message. Like when, if he can find Evie, tell Evie that her father loves her and things like that. So he's got a few little side quests while he's in there. But the main quest is to find Christopher Sunday while at the same time being sucked into this wild assassination slash global extinction subplot. We get a few familiar faces in there. The psycho who was hunting dogs in the first season, he's back. The guy from the ferry who was claiming to be God, who Kevin previously met on the bridge the first time he was in this world, he's back and offering him instructions through an earpiece. So the gang's all here in this alternate reality. But what's really cool is how Kevin uses shards of glass and mirrors and like lenses and glasses to go back and forth between his two versions of himself in this world. Anytime he glances, he can shoo. Basically, it allows him to be in the driver's seat in two places at the same time. And it's just also an interesting storytelling device cutting back and forth between these two characters. On one hand, this story in this alternate reality does successfully wrap itself up because when the two Kevins meet, one finally does carve out the key from the other one's heart because he basically says, look, let's blow this place up so we never have to come back here again. And the president and Patty successfully exterminate the surface of the planet, go up on a building and watch the missiles come in. But the main thing is before that happens, Kevin does successfully get a hold of the prime minister of Australia, who is in fact Christopher Sunday in this world. Christopher Sunday says that he tried to explain it to Kevin Sr., but that this song is not going to do what he's hoping for. And he even, <laughs> very matter of fact, way says, does it make sense to you that this song would stop the floats from coming? He says the song, song doesn't exist. And even Kevin has to admit that it all sounds kind of ridiculous. I mean, let's forget for a moment that he's in an alternate reality as both an assassin and a president talking to an aborigine who's become the prime minister of Australia. Christopher Sunday is a great way of kind of bringing us back down to earth and basically explaining probably the floods aren't coming. And even if they were, a song would not stop them. So at the end, finally, Kevin wakes up and yeah, the rains have stopped. The storm has stopped. Kevin Sr. seems bitterly disappointed. He's sitting on the top of the roof and yeah, he seems like he's lost all sense of purpose. But I guess the good news is the world did not end with a giant flood. What really is going to matter going into the next episode is where is Nora? What has happened to Nora? How is that story going to be resolved? Because clearly I went into this season expecting some massive extinction level event. And a lot of the trailers seem to suggest that you know, a world in chaos. And I guess the fact that a nuclear weapon was fired earlier in the season at a potentially mythical monster shows that there is a, a lot of signs of unrest. However, this is not the level of chaos I guess I was expecting. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised. The Leftovers has always been unpredictable. I keep hoping that we're going to get something really, really big before it draws to a close because just for my own personal taste, I need some sort of closure or satisfactory conclusion related to why the 2% vanished and so on and so forth. It can be pretty much anything, but I need something, or at least a hint of something to uh, to chew on in any case. It's been a killer show. I've absolutely loved the ride. I've I basically binged the first two seasons prior to the start of the third season. I've absolutely loved it. If I had to judge the third season now based just on these seven episodes, I'd say probably a notch below season two. I thought season two was particularly good. I mean, just it really had this epic grandeur and this incredible emotional intensity. And I just was absolutely floored by how that season drew to a close. We shall wait and see what happens with this one. So yeah, I'm not going to offer my final judgment of season three until I've seen next Sunday's episode. But hope you enjoyed this review and recap. Once again, I apologize for being late. Please consider giving my channel a subscribe. And if you want to talk more, please leave a comment in the comments below or give me a shout on Twitter at Colbrex. Hope everyone has a very, very fun day off from work. And I'll talk to you all soon.